Let's go to let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We have been looking at prayer as a subject and this evening we're going to look at Hannah's prayer. And we need to begin uh, really in verse 1, so 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 1 uh, to get uh, the, a sense of her situation and a sense of why uh, she is in such anguish as she is instead of hopping right into, into her prayer to understand that she has really has anguish on top of anguish, that she is being tormented by her rival. Those are the words from, from verse 6. In a place where there shouldn't be a rival at all. But let's go to, to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Verse 1, Now there was a certain man of uh, Remtham, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jero Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Now, I want to make note just for a second that uh, while it says he's from the mountains of Ephraim, he does live in the mountains of Ephraim. While it says he's an Ephraimite, I think that is because he lives in the mountains of Ephraim, but he's not of the tribe of Ephraim. He's actually from the tribe of Levi. They are Levites, and Samuel, their son, is a Levite. And I will tell you how we can know that. Actually, from 1 Chronicles 6, verses 33 to 38, we see that Samuel is in fact a Levite. Now, it doesn't say this here, but uh, matter of fact, not only is he a Levite, but he's from the family of Kohath. That's coming from, from 1 Chronicles. Now, let's continue on. So here we have uh, this, this uh, man named Elkanah, and he had two wives, and here is where we have a problem. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this was never the design of the home. Now, uh, our lesson this evening is not the design of the home, but this, this never works. This never works. Uh, the, the fact is that it is uh, one man and one woman for life. That is the design. That's how it works. And you start introducing other things, such as polygamy, and you're going to see that the home is never the way it's supposed to be. And here is, is Hannah, who's going to be tormented because of this other wife of her husband's. Elkanah has two wives. Now, verse 3, This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. Now we'll know more about them later. They're being introduced at this point as being priests. And we're going to find out more about, about them later, but not in this lesson. But they go up to Shiloh. Now, Understand, here we are in 1 Samuel, the, um, the temple's not built yet. It's not going to be for a considerable amount of time before that happens. We've got to get through the 40 years of Saul, first off. Then we've got to get through the 40 years of, uh, of David. And then it's going to be about 13 years of work of Solomon for that to get done. I believe, I believe it's 13 years. Maybe it's a little less than that. But we've got a long way to go in all of this. And so they are still, the, the, uh, the sacrifices are done where? At the tabernacle, wherever the tabernacle happens to be. Well, it's in Shiloh. So that's where you go. The tabernacle that was made in the book of Exodus, instru uh, God instructing uh, Moses to every detail about it, well, it's still around in these days. So it's gone through, obviously, the days of Moses, the days of uh, Joshua. Uh, it's gone through the days of the judges, and now is uh, in these days, which actually is still under the days of the judges. It's just the, the last portion of it. Now, 
Verse 4, And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. So here is the situation. All right? You have the one, Penina, she has sons and daughters. This would be multiple children. Hannah has none. Verse 6, and her rival. There should not be a rival in the home. There, this is not the place for that. This, is, this does not make for a home where there is a rival. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. So really, Penina is not a good person. Penina is using this situation to her advantage and making Hannah's situation worse. So now we get an idea of what the problem is, what her situation is, and it's an extremely emotional one. It's a very emotional one. Now, we go to verse 8. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? He knows what the situation is. He knows why it is. He's, he's not tone deaf. He knows. And he asks the question, am I not better than ten sons? And the answer to that is, you know, you are husband, but then there are children. You know, you cannot, you cannot replace them, <laughs> that, nor can they replace you. Each has their place. Each is there. And um, I, I will say this, I was asked once by one of my own children, what was the day you were the happiest? And I would say, well, that's hard to tell. That's hard to say. Because there are certain places that have their own happiness that are unmatched. They're unmatched. That the day I was married, was that a happy day? Yes, that was a happy day. It had a happiness to it that, that's not matched. But with the birth of each child, there was happiness that day as well. But it wasn't like getting married. It wasn't like that. Was it greater? No, I wouldn't say greater. Was it lesser? I wouldn't say it was lesser. It, but it was different. It was altogether different and a, a basic desire and a basic need has been fulfilled. And that's, that's, the, that's the human part of it, being human in all of this. It's, that's, that's basic needs that are there. Can he replace ten sons? And the answer is no, not really. No. But she'll accept, as we will see, she'll accept her place, whatever that is. But this is what she does. Verse 9, So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. So this is where his station is. Eli is there. He's, he's a high priest. He's uh, uh, there outside of the, the tabernacle. And so he witnesses what takes place. Hannah, he doesn't, now, now he has no idea who Hannah is or why she's even there. He's going to misjudge actually the, what she is. He's, he's, uh, he's going to have the completely wrong idea concerning her. But she is there because she's been tormented. She is there because of her situation. Now, verse 9, or rather, now, uh, but yeah, let's look at verse 9 again. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was on the seat of the, of the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. So here is where she's going to be praying. She's going to be praying by herself in full view of Eli. 
Hannah is praying in front of the tabernacle. This is, now, did she have to do this? No, she didn't have to be in front of the tabernacle. But she felt that's where she needed to be. She felt that she is going to take her petition as close to God as she can. Did she have to be there? No. But she is in bitterness and deep distress. She's in anguish. And this is where she takes her petition. This is where she goes. In verse 10, And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. So here are the emotions in her prayer. This is her situation. In bitterness of soul, she prays to God. In weeping in anguish, she prays to the Lord. This is how she is going, that's how she's doing it, and it is uncontrollable because of her situation. It is absolutely uncontrollable. This bitterness is what brought her to this point. Now, she's not bitter against God, but she knows who can help her. She's in bitterness because of her current situation. Now, God is not the one who's been tormenting her, but it's by providence that all these things have happened. We'll just have to say that. It's by providence all this has occurred. But she prays in Philippians chapter 4 in verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, that can be, prayers can be during good days. And we do not ever need to forget to pray to God. Days of happiness, there should be a healthy prayer life. In days of misery, bitterness of soul, anguish, weeping and anguish, there should be a healthy prayer life in all of this. And understand, because there, there are some folks out there that they, they are of a sort, that they believe that Christianity is nothing but constant happiness and constant bliss. And it's not the case. Was every day of Christ's life happiness and bliss? I will show you where he too is praying by bitterness of soul. The words are anguish. Where he too, maybe not bitterness of soul like with Hannah, but it is with anguish and he is sweating profoundly usely because of what he knows is about to happen. Now, if that can happen to my Lord, and I can see others such as the apostles and, and the first century Christians of where they are, it's not been a good day. They're praying for Peter to be released because they think he's going to be killed. And he would have been. Was that in those prayers, was that a, a prayer of a happy day? No, it's not. And she sees her only solution in this, and it is the healthy solution, the only real solution, and that is taking her petition to God. Once again, she makes no accusation against God. She does not sin whatsoever with her lips in blaming Him for anything. But this is what she says, verse 11. So we see the emotion in her prayer. Now, then she made a vow. Now that's what Scripture says. She made a vow and said, this is part of her prayer. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Now, here is the prayer, 
and the vow. And I want to also add a little bit of note that yes, it says vow in this, but I'm also going to add that this is a note of there is gratitude due. And she's ready to provide the gratitude in this vow. She's ready to be thankful that the Lord answered her prayer with yes. She's ready for that. Now, as we're going to see, she's also going to be satisfied after this. And this would be before she has Samuel. She's going to be satisfied in this. But here she makes her vow and she says, Look on me and my affliction and remember your maidservant. She does this all very humbly. And the fact that she has certain emotional needs, that she has certain uh, desires in this life, and there's nothing wrong with them whatsoever. They're quite natural. But she's being tormented. But there's more than that. That she's childless and does not want to be childless. Now, she asks for the God to remember her and to give your maidservant a male child. With that, she makes the vow, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and he will be a Nazarite. That's what she's saying. He will be a Nazarite. No razor shall come to his head. Well, the meaning of that would, there's only one meaning to that. That he's going to be one under a Nazarite vow. And, and here is her, this is her gratitude in, in all of this. Of saying, I'm ready to show gratitude in all this. I'm ready to show you thanksgiving in all of this. By the gift that you give me, I'm going to give back. The gift that you give me, and let's face it, everything we possess, we don't possess. It belongs to God. Everything we have, we only have it temporarily. It belongs to God. And she is willing, this is, this is not a, a selfish list of things, of, of demands or something like what, what uh, a child may make uh, concerning their birthday. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. This is something that is of a profound need. Now I will say, because I can say this firsthand, there have been times in my life where I have prayed for what I knew to be a profound need. I knew it. And I'm thankful that God answered it. But therein you also know in your time, in, in your history, there have been things that you needed done that could only be done by God, that it could only be resolved by Him. He's the only one that can do it. And it hasn't been too many years that we had a family that was going through a terrible terrible year. They were saying every morning they woke up with the same thought. And every night they went to sleep with the same thought. And it was terrible. Everything in their life was in turmoil. Everything. And waiting for it to, for wickedness to resolve itself. Waiting for that. And God, and I'm not going to give anybody else the credit, God answered that prayer. He answered that prayer. And it was a basic, and I'll use the word profound again, need. Something that needed to be thoroughly resolved, and it was. And in fact, it was. This is something that is just absolutely part of being human. Now, we go to verse 12. 
And it happened. Now here's Eli. And it happened. As she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. So she's mouthing the words, but she's not saying anything. She's mouthing the words. Now, once again, she didn't have to be there for her prayer to be heard, but that's where she wanted to be. She didn't have to mouth the words for her prayer to be heard, but that's what she does. There's nothing wrong with what she did, nothing wrong at all. But, okay, I'm, I'm saying this for a reason, actually, because there is a Jewish idea that for your prayer to be heard, you are to mouth the words. Not necessarily, you don't have to speak them, but you are to mouth them. All right, that's not the case. All right, that's, that's not the case. She didn't have to do this, but she does. Eli sees what she's doing. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli, misjudging her, thought she was drunk. I guess he had seen drunks before in his day, and I guess uh, he thought that uh, she is, uh, she's, why is, why is she here in front of the, the tabernacle drunk? I guess the drunk doesn't know where they are or can't control such things. Verse 14, so Eli said to her, so here's this rebuke, how long will you be drunk? Will you, uh, I'm sorry, put your wine away from you? But Hannah answered, so this is the end of her prayer. Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. That's what she's been, been doing. Now, all right, talk about feeling small. He ought to, he ought to, uh, in, in making this accusation of, well, why are you here, drunk woman? You know, to get uh, sober up. Well, it's not that at all. Is that she has been pouring out her soul before the Lord. That's what she's been doing. Verse 16, Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Until now what? Well, you kind of interrupted. I would assume that to be the case. Okay? That uh, I was pouring out my soul, and now here you are saying these words. And it's not, it's not true. It's not, and obviously, her speaking like this, he would know immediately, okay, yeah, she's not drunk. Verse 17, Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. Okay, so go in peace. Now, he's not a spokesman for God. He's a high priest, sure. But he's not a spokesman for God, necessarily. Now, obviously, being high priest, he can prophesy if that's what God wants him to, to be doing. But, as a matter of fact, what he says is the truth. That is your petition which you have, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked him. Ask of him. And that, that's actually going to be the case. It is, it is going to be the case. Now, here is her next, after all of this has been done. Because she's no, she knows now she's done all she could. It's not as though she could get any closer to the presence of God than she was at the, tab, at the door of the tabernacle. All right, she can't enter the door in the tabernacle, and she most certainly can't kneel in front of the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. She can't do that. She did as much as she could. And note her change in all this in verse 18. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in, in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She has faith and patience. And that truly can be said. She has faith 
and she has patience, and she meant every word that she said, and she's good for it. You know, there's some folks that may say something. I don't know how many times I've heard it. I really don't know how many times I've heard it of someone telling me that something has occurred in their life, maybe the death of a parent, maybe something else, and saying, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to start coming. I'm going to, I'm going to start bringing the kids. We're going to do this. And in my mind, I think two things. One, I hope it's true. But two, we'll see. You know, we will, we will see. I don't, I don't doubt your words at this moment. I don't doubt your emotions at this moment. But are you going to see it through? Because it's one thing to say something in the height of emotion. It's one thing to do that. But then come the next week, when the emotions have, have resolved themselves, when it's, it, things aren't like they were, what about then? All right. And like I said, I don't know how many times I've heard similar things of, of someone giving assurances, yes, I'm going to do this, and sometimes it doesn't occur. But with Hannah, it does. With Hannah, she's going to keep everything she said. But notice, she's done all she can. Therefore, her, because her anguish has been voiced, because it's been voiced as best as she could, she's now satisfied and she waits for God's answer in this. And once again, here is faith and patience from this, this, this woman who being tormented in, the, in her home and she is sure that whatever the answer is, that God is going to do the right thing, whatever it is. And a matter of fact, it's going to be providential. All of this is providential and we can show that because of who that son will be. Because without coming to this point, and this is, this is God's province working before there's even a prayer. Okay? His providence is working. There's a reason why Hannah couldn't have children at that point in her life. Because it, and there's, there's a reason why there's all this pressure of where she's going to be making that vow because her child is going to be Samuel. Now, if she had had Samuel without all of this, that there was no difficulty in her life, that she had Samuel, would she have made such a vow of where he's going to be serving the Lord all the days of his life? Well, no, there wouldn't have been. There wouldn't have been that vow at all. Samuel would not have known Eli or served in the tabernacle. And he can serve in the tabernacle because he is from Kohath of the Levites. He can do that. And he is going to be serving as the last judge and also as a prophet. And he's also going to be anointing the first two kings of Israel. <laughs> That child is something. And all from this prayer, I'm sorry. <sighs> These days I'm getting emotional. But a, a profound prayer and God answering it and knowing perfectly well what He's going to do. Knowing perfectly well that the providence is leading to this point. And there's going to be someone great born from her. Because she is someone important, having a tremendous faith that she's going to see it through. Now, we look at our lives. God works providentially. And there are things that can be in our life that are less than convenient. That can be, and this is, this is as much of a, a lesson on providence as it is on prayer. But things in our life that can be seen as painful, but it may be there providentially for 
the purposes of God beyond figuring out. She couldn't have known. But God knew. And God works in our lives. And we need to be up to that prayer life, to bring everything to Him, to have the faith, the patience necessary in this, and also to be good in what we say. We look at our own lives now. That judgment is certain. And we will face that judge. Are we ready? If there's any thing that needs to be done in our lives, let's do that thing. Let's grow spiritually. Let's increase in our labors for our God. Let's do this and be the servants we should be. We ask this evening, are you ready for your life to be judged by Him? If there's anything that we can do, if you need to respond to the invitation, we ask that you come as we stand and sing.